Have you ever wanted a Based on a True Story t-shirt or mug? Well, I'm happy to announce now we have some. There's currently a handful of designs and styles to pick from, and I'm hoping to keep adding more soon. So check it out over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash merch. Again, that's basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash merch. Thanks. Last week, we looked at the first half of Cecil B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments. If there's one thing we learned, it's that there's a lot of debates over the events in the movie, or even if the events happened at all. While there's been a lot of debate over whether or not the events we saw in the movie are historically accurate, there's also been a lot of debate over the movie itself. After it was released, a lot of people didn't know and argued one way or another about who the person was that provided the voiceover for the voice of God coming from the burning bush. The role is officially uncredited in the movie, and thanks to some heavy modification on the voice, it's nearly impossible to tell for sure. For the longest time, most people thought Cecil B. DeMille was the one who did the voice, since he provided other narrations throughout the film. But then, in his 1995 autobiography and the DVD version of The Ten Commandments, Charlton Heston said that he was the one who did the voiceover. If nothing else, the mere fact that there's so much debate about who provided the voiceover goes to show how much the movie can get picked over when you're dealing with topics like this. With the debate finally resolved, people could go on to debate the authenticity of the events that the movie was based on, this being a debate that will likely never be resolved. Now, if you haven't listened to part one, I would highly recommend going back and listening to that first, because this week on the podcast, we're going to take a look at the second half of The Ten Commandments. I'm Dan LeFebvre, and this is Based on a True Story. It's time for Two Truths and a Lie. Listen closely for the two truths scattered throughout the episode, then by a process of elimination, you'll know which one was a lie. And we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. Okay, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, Dathan was not the primary leader in a revolt against Moses and Aaron. Number two, the movie shows all of the plagues of Egypt that the Bible mentions. Number three, Joshua led the Hebrew people after Moses passed away. Now, if you listen to part one, You've heard my statement about the religious subject matter in that episode, so I won't bother repeating it here, but let's just say that covers this episode too. Ultimately, even if you disagree with the religious topics in this episode, I hope you can respect those who do believe them and enjoy this historical look at the story behind the Ten Commandments. As the movie fades back in after the intermission, we're no longer in Midian as we see the beautiful pyramids of Egypt. Next, we're in Pharaoh's throne room as ambassadors from around the world are delivering some of the finest luxury goods. You can probably guess by now that there's no way to know if this scene is true. We just don't have the evidence of it in historical records. But there are bits and pieces we can test against history. For example, one of the luxury goods brought before the pharaoh is something they refer to as a cloth spun by the gods called silk. The first mention of silk we have comes from China, dating back somewhere between 4,000 and 3,000 before the Common Era, while the first evidence in Egypt is around 1,000 BCE. So that's a little bit after Ramesses II took power in 1279 BCE, but I'd say it's definitely possible that it could have shown up earlier than 1000 BCE. I mean, if the Chinese were using it for over a thousand years before, as the Egyptian empire grew, it would make sense that they would expand their riches with goods from around the world. But we just don't have evidence of that in the time of Ramesses II. 
Then there's the ambassador of Jericho. That was a real place, too. In fact, it's not that Jericho was a real place. It is a real place. Located north of the Dead Sea in the West Bank region, to this day, Jericho is the oldest continually inhabited city on the planet, with a history dating back almost 14,000 years. One of the emissaries to Pharaoh is Moses, along with his brother Aaron. This begins the warning that Moses brings to Egypt, demanding that the Hebrew slaves be set free. When Ramesses refuses in the movie, Moses commands Aaron to cast down his staff. When he does, it's transformed into a snake before the eyes of everyone there. According to the movie, Ramesses is unfazed. His own priest casts down their staffs, and they're transformed into snakes as well. But then Moses' snake kills the other two snakes from Pharaoh's priests. It doesn't work, though. The movie shows Yul Brenner's version of Ramesses tell Moses that his staff can perform a bigger miracle— let the slaves make brick without straw, an essential ingredient. Here, the movie makes a distinct alteration from the account that we see in the Bible. So the part that the movie gets right, at least according to the Bible's account, is when Moses and Aaron walk into Pharaoh and demand he release the slaves. When Pharaoh, re remember the Bible never specifically calls him Ramesses, anyway, when he refused, he simply jumped directly to declaring that the Egyptians wouldn't give the slaves straw anymore. They would have to get it themselves. You can read that account in Exodus 5. And it's not until two chapters later, in Exodus 7, that the account happens when Moses' staff turns into a snake. In that chapter, yes, the staff turns into a snake and the Egyptian magicians drop their staffs. It doesn't say exactly how many there were, but those turn into snakes too. Then the staff-turned snake devours the Egyptian staff-turned snakes, very similar to what we saw in the movie. But all of that happens when Moses comes back later for a second time. Not to get too far ahead of our story, but the movie basically mentions this too early. Oh, and the movie shows Moses giving his staff to Aaron. In Exodus, it was Aaron's own staff and not Moses' staff that did the magical transformation as Exodus chapter 7, verses 10 through 14 say, quote, And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. And he hardened Pharaoh's heart, that he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuseth to let the people go. End quote. But even though the movie shows that passage is happening the first time Moses and Aaron visit Pharaoh, that's actually a later visit, as we heard. As such, it's ahead of where we are in the movie. Getting back to where we are in the movie, after Pharaoh refuses to let the slaves go, it's Moses and Aaron who have to deliver the bad news to the slaves that they'll be getting their own straw from now on. They expected a deliverer, and they received even more hard work. While the movie makes it seem more emotional to see Charlton Heston's version of Moses have to deliver the bad word himself alongside his brother Aaron, the story according to Exodus tells us that it was the Egyptian taskmasters and not Moses and Aaron who told the slaves the bad news. Exodus chapter 5 verses 10 through 13 explain, quote, And the taskmasters of the people went out and their officers, and they spake to the people, saying, Thus saith Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go ye, get you straw where ye can find it, yet not aught of your work shall be diminished. So the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of straw, and the taskmasters hasted them, saying, Fulfill your works, your daily tasks, as when there was straw. End quote. So there's a slight difference between movie and history, according to Exodus. 
But the basic idea is fairly similar. The movie even has Dathan there to explain that they'll have to go collect the stubble in the fields. All of this basically, as the movie shows, made their workload that much more. Without straw given to them, the slaves would have to gather the straw themselves, while at the same time making the same number of bricks that they were making before. It sort of makes you wonder, who was giving them the straw before, that they weren't gathering it themselves prior to this? Anyway, after this initial disaster between Moses and Ramesses, Moses is whisked away to Nefertiri. She's apparently still harboring her love for him, but Moses is less than impressed now. As we learned in part one, there's no evidence to suggest there was any romantic relationship between Moses and Nefertiri. Then we see Joshua and his romantic interest, Lilia. And again, we have no evidence of Lilia's existence or there being any romantic connection. All of that is made up for the movie. To do a little recap of Moses and Aaron's visits to Pharaoh according to the Bible, the first visit... Pharaoh flat out refused and demanded instead that the slaves now need to gather their own straw. Then Moses and Aaron came back and performed the miracle with Aaron's staff turning into a snake. Pharaoh still refused to let the Hebrew people go. Then the next morning, Moses and Aaron returned. So the film seemed to have turned those first two visits into a single visit. Because in the next scene in the movie, we see Moses and Aaron return to Pharaoh again to demand the release of the slaves. When Yul Brenner's Ramesses refuses, Moses again hands his staff to Aaron, who, in turn, stretches it against the waters, and it turns red with blood. Moses says this will last for seven days, and Egypt will be without water for that period. If you've heard of the ten plagues of Egypt— This was the first of those plagues. And the historical validity of the first plague is something that historians, Egyptologists, scholars, archaeologists, and religious people throughout the millennia have tried to prove and disprove one way or another. How could the rivers of the Nile be turned red with blood? If you believe the account in the Bible, it wasn't normal water turned red with discoloration, as Exodus chapter 7 verses 20 to 21 say, quote, And Moses and Aaron did so as the Lord commanded. And he lifted up the rod and smote the waters that were in the river in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. And all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. And the fish that was in the river died and the river stank. And